So today I'm going to take on a subject that comes around from time to time. I have spoken on it before, but I'm going to elaborate on it a little bit further. And the subject matter starts once again with WorldNetDaily.com. The article is titled, Mega Pastor Accused of Heresy for Attack on Old Testament. Now, I'm going to go ahead and read this first and then give my comments and back it up with scripture. Mega Pastor Andy Stanley caught a lot of theological flack back in May for telling his congrega congregation that it was time to unhitch from the Old Testament. <clears throat> this weekend, however, Albert Moeller, president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, hit back by comparing Stanley's continuing controversial comments on the matter with ancient heresy. Writing in Salem Communications, ChristianHeadlines.com, Moeller alluded to error of Mar Marcion, who claimed that the God of the Old Testament was not the same as the God of the New Testament. For his part, Stanley recently suggested that they were the same God, but he was doing two different things. We are looking here at the ancient heresy of Marcion, who argued that the Old Testament must be repudiated by the church, wrote Moeller. Marcion, who lived about the years 85 through 160, taught that the Old Testament revealed a creator deity who is not even the same God who sent, as, and I quote them saying, Jesus. Unsurprisingly, he also held to a heretical Christi Christiology. The Old Testament deity was repugnant to Marcion, who argued that Christianity just make a clean break from Judaism. The Old Testament, he taught, reveals a vindictive law-giving creator, deity, who bears no resemblance to the merciful, redeeming God revealed in, as he says, Jesus Christ. As Irenaeus, one of the most significant church fathers, argued, Marcion himself divides God in two, saying that one is good and the other judicial, and in so doing takes God away from both. He continues, Marcion was embarrassed by the Old Testament, and so are many people, many modern people. Andy Stanley, at the very least, seems to fear that embarrassed in, embarrassment in others, even though even if he does not identify it himself. It is rare for American evangelical titans to clash publicly over basic theological doctrine, but that's what's happening here. It all started months ago when Stanley de delivered a sermon to his flock of mega, uh, mega churches in suburban Atlanta where some 32,000 followers listened attentively every Sunday, suggested the Christian faith must be unhitched from the Old Testament. He claimed that Peter, James, Paul elected to unhitch the Christian faith from the, their Jewish scriptures, and my friends, we must as well. There was a shock, wonder, bewilderment expressed by many in the church. Later, in, in answer to the ensuing controversy, Stanley, the son of Pastor James Stanley, Charles Stanley, told Relevant Magazine, well, I never suggested we unhitch from a passage of the scripture or a specific biblical imperative. Again, I was preaching to Acts 15, where Peter, James, and Paul recommend the first century church unhitch. My word, I'm open to an alternative. The law of Moses from the gospel being preached to the Gentiles in Antioch. I don't think I'm going to read this whole thing. It's too long. I think you get the gist, the concept of what's going on here. So, first of all, Part of the deception here, part of the error, is in the very title of this article. Mega pastor accused of heresy for attack on Old Testament. Okay? And then the writer of the article, and I'm not by any means defending this so called mega pastor, but to suggest that merely unhitching, see, 
the old, it's not an Old Testament, it's the Old Covenant. And if you read Hebrews 8, verses 8 through 12, the Old Covenant has been replaced with the New Covenant. What is called, it's kind of like, how do I put this? So, for instance, people today use the term, the word church for a building. The church was never a building. Um, the church is not the, um, the so-called leadership. That's not it either. The church is a congregation. It's a group of people. That's all it means. A congregation. And when you start using words that are not compatible in their meaning, and you're, you're trying to change the meaning to something else, that opens the path wide open to deception and error. Okay, so for instance, the prophets, Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, Malachi, Amos, Hosea, all of the prophets, even David, Samuel, that's not Old Testament. That's the prophets. And so, when you read through this whole thing, they don't differentiate, they're not differentiating between the Old Covenant and the prophets because the prophets, each and every one of the prophets, even Obadiah, in some form or another, talked about the new covenant, the coming new covenant. What is that new covenant? That new covenant is the forgiveness of Israel's sins. And as we read in Isaiah and some other prophets, that even Gentiles will be able to partake in the new covenant. So, <clears throat> It's, this is pure blindness. And I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to continue reading through here, where it says, there was a shock, wonder, bewilderment expressed by many in the church, and later in Answer to the ensuing controversy, Stanley, the son of Pastor Charles Stanley, told a relevant magazine, well, I never suggested we unhitch from a passage of scripture or a specific biblical imperative. Again, I was preaching through Acts 15, where Peter, Paul, and James recommended the first century church to unhitch my word. I'm open to alternative, the law of Moses, from the gospel being preached to the Gentiles in Antioch. In Acts 15, a controversy arose over whether circumcision was a requirement for salvation and whether new Gentile believers would be required to observe the law of Moses. In Acts 15, verse 19 through 21, the Apostle James, though, or thought to be a brother of, I'm just going to start saying Yehoshua, folks. This is, Thought to be the brother of Yehoshua and the head of the church in Jerusalem. Head of the church in Jerusalem? Offered. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to Jehovah, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols, from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses of old time has in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Far from suggesting new Gentile believers would be exempt from all the law of Moses, this decision 
accepted by all the apostles provided some baseline laws the Gentiles would be required to keep. While they attended synagogue every week and were given a chance to learn the rest over time. Learn what of the rest over time? Well, what, well, what's he trying to say here? Circumcision? <sighs> Explains Joseph Farah, author of the new book, The Gospel, in every book in the Old Testament. And the restitution of all things Israel. <clears throat> the only scriptures that existed at this time were the Hebrew scriptures, which were consistently, constantly cited by the apostles as the living, breathing word of Jehovah. But what Moeller put, what put Moeller over the edge were recent comments by Stanley in a podcast in which he had said he had outgrown his simple childhood belief about the Bible and that the references in the New Testament to Scripture did not mean the Bible. Once again, play on words, folks. This is something I'm trying desperately to help people understand, and every time I try to explain it, it gets misunderstood. So here I go again, said Stanley. There was no Bible until the 4th century. When we think about the Bible, we think about a book that contains the Jewish scripture and the Christian writings, and such a thing did not exist until after Christianity became legal and scholars could come out of the shadows and actually put such a thing together. Well, that's a whole other subject matter, folks. As you well know, people were murdered by the so-called church people for printing the Bible. Because they had wanted to have nothing to do with it. So, concerning circumcision. Well, the question rose up. If Paul insisted that circumcision was unnecessary for salvation, Galatians 5, why did he circumcise Timothy in Acts 16 and verse 3? Well, the answer is very simple. Timothy had a Jewish mother. His father was Greek. And by Jewish law, that would make Timothy a Jew. And because of the Jews, he circumcised Timothy. All right? But Titus, Titus was a Gentile. I hope I never said, mixed, uh, mixed the two of them up. Titus was a Gentile. He, he had no Jewish blood in him. And so when there were Jews among the Gentile church, who tried to convince the Gentiles to circumcise themselves, Titus would have nothing to do with it. And he was right. Why? Because the law of circumcision was only for the people of Israel. Now, that takes me to where I want to go here. All right. Where is this? This is Exodus 12. Okay, and Jehovah, uh, verse 43, And Jehovah said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No stranger shall eat thereof. What? No foreigner. Why not? Because it was only for Israel. But every man's servant that is bought for money, when you have circumcised it, he shall eat thereof. So the man's servant that he had circumcised can eat of the Passover. And a foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. You shall not carry forth 
the flesh abroad uh, out of it, out of the house. Neither shall you break a bone. All the congregation of, of Israel shall eat it. And when a stranger shall sojourn with, uh, with you and will keep the Passover to Jehovah, let all his males be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it. And then he will be as one that is born in the land. Another, this word sojourn is not what we think it is. This person comes to live in the land of Israel and, listen very carefully, comes to live in the land of Israel and converts to this covenant. Just the old covenant. Then he was to be circumcised. It says one sh one law. So for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. One law shall be to him that is homeborn, and unto the stranger that sojourns among among you. Now the word. Let's look up the word sojourn so that we all understand. literally means become one of them. Abide. Who comes to live with you. Who becomes one of them. Now, you know, Ruth, even though she was woman, was a primary example. She was a Moabite woman. Now, I'm going to see if I can find. All right. Um, I had forgotten where this, um, it was when they were on Mount Sinai, or when, when, uh, when Moses was on Mount Sinai, and Jehovah told Moses that, that the Torah was not given to anyone before him, it was only for Israel. The Torah. Now, let's then go to Matthew 5 and verse 17. Now, Christian preachers so famously pervert the words of this first sentence. Here's what they say. Think not that I am come to destroy the law. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. W w what's missing here? Let's read it again as it's written. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. I verily I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass, not one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now listen to this carefully, folks. Whatsoever, therefore, shall break one of these least in size commandments and shall teach men to do so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, I want to go to uh, Luke. 
Luke 6, starting in verse 1, And it came to pass that on the second Sabbath, after the first, what do you mean the second Sabbath after the first? I'm not even sure I know what that means, but it was a Sabbath nevertheless. I have a feeling that the first one might have actually been a holy day. But they're both Sabbaths, all right? That he went through the cornfields, and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. And certain of the Pharisees said unto him, unto them, Why do you that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? And Yeshua, Yehoshua answered and said, Have you not read so much as this? What David did when himself was a hungered, and they which were with him, how they went into the house of Jehovah, and did take and eat the showbread, and gave also to them that were with him, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone. And he said unto them, The Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So what did Yehoshua just do? He overrode the Sabbath. Now, let me show you something. Ezekiel 20 and verse 12. Moreover, uh, yeah, moreover, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them. Who? Between Jehovah and Israel. Why? that they might know that he is Jehovah that sanctifies them. Okay? Why then did Jehoshua loosen restrictions concerning the Sabbath? He's in another particular passage, he said, because the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Now, it is interesting. Yehoshua says in John 3, 13, verse 35, By this will all men know you are my disciples if you love one another. But wait. You see, there are two sets of commandments. One, you shall love Jehovah your Elohim with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. And that which hung on those two was, uh, on that particular one were, you shall not make unto you any graven images, neither shall you bow down and worship them. And um, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Okay. But right here, Yehoshua says, By this shall all men know you are my disciples if you love one another. So the Sabbath was a sign between Jehovah and Israel that he had sanctified Israel that he had sanctified Israel. Do you get it? Once again, Jehoshua says, by all men, by all by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. 
love your neighbor as yourself. On that particular one, on that particular commandment, hanged the lesser commandments. You know, the ones where Yehoshua said, If any man teach the least of the commandments, let's see, let's see if I can find it again. Yes, think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For this reason I say to you, until heaven and earth pass, not one jot or tittle shall in any way pass from the law till it all be fulfilled. Whosoever, interestingly enough, he said, until all be fulfilled. Why did he? Why did he add that? Why did he add that to all be fulfilled? All of what be fulfilled? So it says, "Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least, these least commandments, and teach men to do so, shall be called the least in the kingdom. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same, they shall be called great in the kingdom." All right, so we're talking about the least commandments, the lesser commandments. Why has that become more important now? Well, the question is, is did the Sabbath make the Pharisees righteous? They used the law to exact heavy burdens on the people and the law of the Sabbath was the main one they did it with. And so, when the disciples were picking grain out of the field, he had to explain to them that the Son of Man supersedes the Sabbath. See, the Sabbath points to a time of rest for Israel. And the vehicle for that rest is Yehoshua the Messiah. Rest from what? Rest from sins. In other words, he is the vehicle where forgiveness of the sins of Israel is, is going to come to Israel. Freedom, uh, liberty from the burden of their past sins. That's what the new covenant is all about. What about these lesser commandments? Okay, let's let me uh, list the lesser commandments off for you. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Uh, you shall love, uh, you shall honor your mother and your father, and um, you shall not covet anything of your, that your neighbor has. On one commandment hangs these, these particular commandments. Now let's go and we'll find back up to that. Now, first thing that happens, when we go to Matthew 22, verse 40, it says, All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. You shall love the, 
Jehovah, your Elohim, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your, your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But then look at this. Matthew 7 and verse 12. The golden rule. Everything whatsoever you desire that people should do for you, do likewise for them. For this is the law and the prophets. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So when he said the least of the commandments, he was specific. He was talking about the lesser commandments. Why? Because... Under the Pharisees, Israel failed to keep the law. Using, using the commandments and the law to impose harsh cruelty upon the people, which was the opposite of what was intended. So, this is backed up by, I believe it was James, or was it John? Let's see. thing is messing me up. John is speaking about one of the lesser commandments and tying it to the greatest of all. If a man says, I love Jehovah and hates his brother, he is a liar. So if you don't keep the lesser commandments, you don't keep the greater one either. This is the reason why Yehoshua said, if anyone teaches people to not keep the, the, the least of the commandments, he shall be called least in the kingdom. But he who not only teaches the lesser commandments, but also does them, he shall be called great in the kingdom. So, if a man say that he loves our Father in heaven and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love our Father in heaven whom he has not seen? If you hate your brother, you don't love our Father in heaven. So, which brings me to, 
I always do this. I can't help it. I've got to go find it. I pulled up so many things here. So, love your brother, right? Mercy rules over judgment. Let's do that one. James 2.13 For he shall have judgment without mercy on anyone who showed no mercy because mercy supersedes judgment. That's right. Mercy supersedes judgment. See, that's a part of the New Covenant, too. Now, bearing that in mind, let's go to um, delete some of these things here. I want to go to Wikipedia and the name, Irene Gut Opdyke. Irene Gut Opdyke, born Irene Gut, the 5th of May, 1922, and lived until May 17, 2003, was a Polish nurse who gained international recognition for aiding Polish Jews persecuted by Nazi Germany during World War II. She was honored as righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem for risking her own life to save 12 Jews from certain death. Irene Gut was born into a Catholic family, and those of you who know me knows how I feel about the so-called Catholic Church. Two ideologies who cause more misery and pain and death than any other that the world has ever seen has been the Catholic Church and Communists. Now, people say, what about Nazis? Nazi, the Nazis fell under the Catholic Church, folks. Hitler was a Nazi. Uh, Hitler was a Catholic. Now, for those of you who are Protestants who say, well, that does not have anything to do with me. Adolf Hitler used the words of Martin Luther to justify the slaying of the Jews. So that's you too, Protestants. All right. She was born into a Catholic family with five daughters in Kozien, Kozienis, Poland. During the interwar period, the family moved to Radom, where she enrolled in the nursing school before the Nazi-Soviet invasion of 1939. Yes, the Nazis and the Soviets worked together to invade Poland. At the age of 20, Irina witnessed a German soldier kill an infant in 1942. This event transformed her life. During the German occupation, Gut was hired by Wehrmacht Major Edward Rugemer to work in a kitchen of a hotel which frequently served Nazi officials. Inspired by her religious faith, what? No, inspired by her conscience. Because the religious faith of the, of the Catholics was not to help the Jews. It was to turn their backs on the Jews. This was her conscience talking to her. Gut would secretly take food from the hotel and deliver it to the Redom ghetto. Gut smuggled Jews out of the ghetto into surrounding forests and delivered food for them there as well. Meanwhile, 
Rugemer asked Gut to work as a housekeeper in his requisitioned villa. She hid 12 Jews in the cellar. They would come out and help her clean the house when he was not around. One day, Rugemer found out about the Jews she was hiding and at personal risk to all their lives. Rugemer kept Gut's secret and she became his mistress. Yes, she had to prostitute herself to save the Jews. And she was a good looking woman, by the way. I'm looking at her picture. She was a good looking woman back then. And I know this does sound terrible, what I'm saying, doesn't it? Well, she had to use any weapon that she could to fight evil. And she had one that worked effectively. Now, let's see if I can find... Oh, yes. Galatians 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faith. Irene Good had all of these qualities, even though she was a Catholic. Um, there's another scripture that I need to find. As it is important, I had it saved. Let's see. There we go. Jude 1. Let's start in verse 22. And some have compassion, making a difference. And others save, let's literally save people's lives with fear, pulling them out of the fire. This is what Irene Good did. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. What in the world is that supposed to mean? Well, you see, after that, Irene Good was silent never spoke a word about this particular episode in her life until 1975 when Holocaust deniers started spreading their venom around and she had to speak up and she went around then that's a long time think about it from 1945 to 1975 what is that 30 years 30 solid years she stayed quiet about it didn't breathe a word. But then she had to, was forced to because of the Holocaust deniers. And when she told her story, she would always wear the harlot's dress, the red dress. And when I see where it says, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh, I think there's an insinuation here. Now, So the question comes up then, can a Catholic be saved? Can a communist be saved? When a communist, let's see, yeah. So let's, uh, let's find a communist. Um, Haaretz, uh, this woman is a hero of the Holocaust in Poland, but virtually unknown in Israel. Irina Sedleroa saved 25,000 children from the Warsaw Ghetto during the World War II, but only now, a decade after her death, her story of altruism is told in a book just released in Israel. And this article was posted on April 11, 2018. She was a communist. Two of the most wicked groups of people ever on the earth. Now, 
We just read. We just read in James 2.13. For Jehovah will not show mercy when he judges the person who has not been merciful. Because mercy triumphs over judgment, or mercy supersedes judgment. What's going to happen to these people, these sinners, who showed mercy? Well, we just, uh, King James, he will have judgment without mercy that showed no mercy. Because mercy rejoices against judgment. All right, let's find out. Matthew 25. Verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him. Then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. Which throne is he going to sit on? It's the throne of David. And before him shall be gathered all, all the Gentiles. All nations means all the Gentiles. And he shall separate them one from another as sheep divides his sheep, as shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. And then the king shall say to them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. And then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Master, when did we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and took you in, or naked or clo and clothed you? When did we see you sick or in prison and came unto you? And then the king shall answer and say unto them, Listen carefully, verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one. Just one. Of the least of these, my brethren, who is he talking about? Israel, the Jews. You have done it unto me. Where does it say, these are the Gentiles now. The Gentiles were not given the Sabbath if they were a, still, a, still a Gentile, only if they were a sojourner in the land of Israel was the, the, the how do I put this, was the Torah given to them, including circumcision and all of that. The Sabbath was a sign between Israel and Jehovah. So this is the nations, the Gentiles. Mercy rules over judgment. Mercy supersedes judgment. So all of these Gentiles who lifted their hand to help just one Jew during the Holocaust, during the Holocaust from 67 AD until now, they will be invited in. If they did any of those things that he said, that is, that's huge, folks. All they had to do was show mercy to just one to just one. How merciful is that? Oh, you showed mercy to just one of the least of the brethren? Enter into my kingdom is what he's going to say. And then he shall say unto them on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in naked, and you clothed me not sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. And then they shall say unto him, When did we, when did we see you a hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto you? And he answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you didn't do it to a single one of the least of these, 
you did not unto me. Not one. So you see, folks, there's your answer. The least of the commandments. The Sabbath is about, it really is about the new covenant. It points to a time when all Israel will be given rest from their enemies, from pestilence, from warfare, from hardship. That's what it's assigned for. And in the Old Covenant, it was a sign between Jehovah and Israel. In the New Covenant, the sign between Jehoshua and his disciples is that you love one another. I think I've about covered what I wanted to cover here. I'm trying to remember every, anything else. I, I, I can't think of anything else, but I, I hope you understand what he means when he says the least of the commandments. It is answered in Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats. And it's answered in... Um, was it? It was a James. Was well, also answered in uh, John thirteen thirty five. Um, and also, I believe it was Jude. Jude uh, one verse twenty two and twenty three. How can how can anyone not understand now? And the prophets do matter. Moses and the prophets do matter. Because Moses spoke about the new covenant and all the prophets spoke about the new covenant. And the preacher, the paid preacher... They take your money and they blind you. You don't need to, you don't need to be among those folks. <laughs>